One of the things that you quickly realize when you're doing work on uh, the way in which the United States memorialized its role in the First World War is that um, commemoration on a federal level was far less influential where, where most Americans were concerned than endeavors, as you've already seen at the state level, at the county level, and even at the, the community level. Um, the federal government's role in commemoration was really limited to, to two things. Uh, there was talk in Washington, D.C. in the early 1920s about establishing a national memorial to America in the Great War. That never happened. And in fact, that's only going to happen here in the near, in the, or has only recently uh, occurred as we heard earlier this morning. The Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, which was an idea that was borrowed from the British and the French, was never intended to be a national memorial per se, but it became the de facto memorial in the 1920s and 30s because nothing else had been built in the nation's capital. Of course, the meaning of that particular memorial changes profoundly when two additional bodies are added in the aftermath of the Second World War, one from the Pacific Theater, one from the European, and then of course you have the addition of fatalities, unknown fatalities from Korea and Vietnam. So when we think about the thousands and thousands, and I'm not exaggerating, there are literally thousands and thousands of World War I memorials in the United States, we're talking about the products of what are essentially local passions and politics. And these memorials, as you have already heard, uh, took shape in a number of different ways. We had so-called living memorials, like the building that we're in, functional utilitarian spaces, student unions, courthouses, football stadiums, you name it buildings that would serve a purpose, but at the same time hopefully remind people of the nation's sacrifices in the Great War. More traditional monuments were also manifested in a wide variety of ways. Public statues, victory arches, parks, trees that were even planted and intended to symbolize individual soldiers, street names, okay? that were named after major military figures and also local heroes. It's also important to remember that every American Legion post in the United States established in the aftermath of World War I is itself a memorial. All of those posts are named after significant local fatalities or local heroes. Great student project is to ask students to find out why is that American Legion Hall down the street? Why, does it, why is it named after this particular person? And there's always an interesting story pertaining to American involvement in World War I that you'll find there. Okay? So I'm going to talk about the, the, and this is wonderful juxtaposition with the presentation you just heard, I'm going to talk about the physical monument, the statue, that more than 150 American communities decided best represented their view of the war to end all war. And that statue, which many of you have probably seen in this room, is right here. The Spirit of the American Doughboy by the Indiana-born uh, sculptor E.M. Vicaney. Uh, and that's, of course, not the way that's going to sound in French, but that's the way that the name is still pronounced with, uh, with an Indiana twang in the area around Spencer where he grew up. Um, the Caney statue was the most popular, and some have even argued that next to the Statue of Liberty, this particular piece of art has been seen by more Americans than any other piece of public statuary. Okay? 100, nearly 140 examples of this statue still exist today in communities from coast to coast, okay, in more than 35 different states. And if the statue seems familiar to some of you in this room, that might be because there are three examples still standing in the state of Alabama, including this one in the town of Anniston. And I apologize for the, the grainy quality of the image here. It's my ambition. Uh, to visit all of these memorials and photograph them eventually, uh, my perverse idea of a good time. Um, but uh, this is an image that I took off the, off the web. There's also um, one standing in Bessemer, Alabama. And uh, some of what uh, uh, Professor Olaf had to say and Professor Scheftel about uh, uh, 
the, the segregation of the armed forces and the segregation of, uh, of American communities in the teens and 20s is reflected in this particular memorial, which has the names of the uh, Caucasian servicemen on one side and the names of the African American veterans on the other. And that's by no means unusual. You'll find that sort of segregated remembrance in communities, uh, both, both south and north of the Mason-Dixon line. Okay, that's not uh, exclusively a southern memorial manifestation. Some of you may have seen this one, which is in Birmingham. So these are three examples. Why was the statue so popular? Well, I'm going to speculate in a moment about some of the design elements that I think appeal to people and some of the ideologies that this statue managed to tap into. But there's also a more mundane explanation for its popularity. It was cheap. These statues are not bronze castings. They're often misidentified that way, but they're not. So unlike other soldier statues that you may be familiar with, this is not a solid bronze cast. This is actually a statue made out of sheets, sheets of copper alloy, okay, that are fitted onto an internal framework and then welded together. So what's the advantage cost-wise? It's light. This statue, which stands seven feet tall, and I'm not talking about the pedestal, I'm talking about the actual statue, weighs about 200 pounds. So the transportation cost involved in uh, moving this statue from Americus, Georgia, where we're going to see that uh, uh, Vicanay sets up his studio, to your community, Anniston, Bessemer, Birmingham, was considerably lower than if you purchased a statue from one of Vicanay's competitors who was working with, with bronze. How much did the statue cost? Well, a community could purchase one of these um, any time after uh, it was patented in December 1920. Any time, say, between 1920 and 1925, this would cost about $2,000. And if you put that into our contemporary currency, that's about $20,000. And I suspect that, uh, that Rod and Monique could uh, tell you that uh, um, creating memorial statues in the 21st century is a considerably more expensive endeavor than that. So these were reasonably priced and they were well within the financial means of the communities that wished to have them erected. This one's in Eufaula and it's not a Vicany. It's a Vicany knockoff. It was created by a rival artist. We don't know who because the artist is not identified. And you'll notice that some of the features of the Vicony statue are, are not included here, but the general stance, the raised arm, the, 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 the hand holding the grenade, the 1903 model Springfield in the other hand are uh, faithful to the original statue. Vicony's chief competitor was John Paulding, who was head of the American uh, Art Bronze Studio in Chicago. And John Paulding had a number of Doughboy statues that are, are now misidentified as examples of spirit of the American Doughboy. This one stands outside the Leavenworth County Courthouse in Leavenworth, Kansas. It was restored in 2000, and the plaque at the bottom of the statue, which proudly describes the restoration process, misidentifies it as spirit of the American Doughboy by E.M. Vickany. Okay? So the designs were very similar, and that's significant for reasons that will become clear here in just a moment. Who was Ernest Moore Vickany? He was born in Spencer, Indiana in 1876. He was the son of a sculptor. He served in the Spanish-American War, and by the time of the Great War, he was living in America's Georgia. He was there because he was working on statuary at the Federal Cemetery located near the notorious Andersonville prison site. Okay? And he realized, uh, as the war ended, that there would be an explosion of interest in commemorative statuary. And so he invited a returning soldier, a gentleman by the name of Walter Rylander, to uh, pose for him in full battle gear. And the result, according to Vickany at least, was the creation of this statue. One of the many things that I think are interesting about this man is he was much more P.T. Barnum than Michelangelo. Uh, he aggressively promoted his work. He was a master of advertising, okay, as you'll see in a moment. He was also a bit of a scoundrel, why you might wonder. Well, uh, the statue is patented in December 1920. Uh, sales are robust. American communities elect this sculpture over many others. And then suddenly he finds himself in trouble. In 1922, John Paulding, the gentleman who was head of that 
American Art Bronze Foundry in Chicago, comes forward with a suit against Bikini, claiming that he has breached copyright. And it turns out that this statue, titled Over the Top, was in fact patented several months before Vikinese. And so even though Vikinese soldiers holding a grenade, the similarities between the two I need not point out. Now we don't know the outcome of that uh, suit, but what we do know is that unspecified financial difficulties forced Vikine to sell his entire business to none other, none other than Walter Rylander in 1922. My theory is that he probably settled out of court and had to concede that he had stolen his design from John Paulding. Okay? Vickany goes on to have an interesting career creating soldier statues. He creates a number that never really quite caught on during the Second World War. His life was also very tragic. He was married and widowed twice. And after the loss of his second wife, Betty Sadler, in 1946, uh, Vickany killed himself by basically shedding himself in the garage and uh, allowing the, the, the car to run. So he's an interesting, um, I think, um, um, unfairly forgotten figure in the history of American war remembrance, and uh, I think an interesting one. Here's an example of one of his ads, and there is not a single advertising ploy that he will not try out. So in this one, he's actually promoting what he called his statuette, which is what I have right here. And most of these were manufactured from uh, 1920 until about 1925. What did this cost during that period? You could buy one of these for about six bucks, okay? And um, uh, they go for just a little bit more now. Uh, you'll notice that uh, this one, well, actually five dollars in the ad here. Authentic, accurate, 100% perfect, amazing realism, says American Legion commander, who I'm 99% certain never said that. Uh, you'll also notice that if you want to get into the statuette business, there are opportunities for you. Look down here at the box on the left. Special terms to agents, hundreds of statues sold daily, an amazing big money opportunity for you right today for special prices. A masterpiece for home, store, and office. Okay? So this is very characteristic of the kind of advertising that, that Vic and A employed. It's estimated that in about the first five years of their manufacture, about 25,000 of these statuettes were purchased by Americans. They were aggressively advertised in a number of venues, including the American Legion Monthly Magazine. So they were really targeted at veterans. And the argument was, why have war commemoration on the town square when you can also have it uh, on your mantle, okay, in your, uh, uh, in your living room? And so these were very popular. There was another version in which you have essentially the same design, but, uh, but, but you have a lamp right here. You have a light bulb, okay? And then you put a shade on top of that, okay? If any of you have discerned similarities between this design and the Statue of Liberty, you can kind of see why they decided to, to put a lamp right there. Now, this might all seem like uh, trivial ephemeral, not really important to uh, our understanding of the memory of the Great War in the United States. But I would argue that there's a lot to be learned when we look at this statue. Okay. For one thing, we see that over 150 American communities decided to invest in a statue that was not some abstract depiction of Joan of Arc or Uncle Sam or of some female figure of civilization rescued from the Hun. They decided to invest in a lifelike image of an American soldier, one that would be accurate in all of its essential details. And in terms of the uh, equipment and the uniform and the weaponry, this is in fact the case. This is an extremely lifelike representation of an American soldier, a.k.a. a doughboy, in the First World War. On his chest is what we would call uh, a gas mask today, but which was known then as the box respirator. It was a British design adopted by the American Army. We see his model 1903 Springfield. We see the wrap leggings. And we also have the added realism of the, the pedestal, where we see a blasted tree trunk in the background and actual barbed wire wrapped around. But in other respects, this is not a realistic image. It's an image of triumph, of, of, of triumph, and in order to create that sense of triumph, we seem to violate the tenets of realism that the statue is working from. It's hard to imagine any American soldier who values his life the teeniest bit actually advancing across no man's land with this posture. Okay? It's also hard to imagine a grenade released at this point landing other, anywhere other than at the feet of the soldier who has thrown it. Okay? So it's obvious that Vicanet was torn in two directions in the creation of this statue. 
um, toward uh, appeasing, if you wish, uh, veterans who would be examining the art and expecting to see uh, the equipment and the weaponry uh, to be reproduced with exactitude, but also to celebrate this American intervention in the Great War and to suggest triumph. And this, of course, is suggested in the stance of the soldier himself. Okay? So in a way, the statue is a throwback to the realistic statuary that you see atop Civil War memorials, those constructed by the United Confederate Veterans, well, constructed by the daughters of Confederate veterans more often than anything else to commemorate the, uh, the achievements of uh, Confederate soldiers in the Civil War or those erected by the Grand Army of the Republic. What's, what's different is this use of the, of the lifted arm and the grenade. Now, in, when I wrote about this statue in, uh, in uh, my book on the battlefield of memory, I argued that it's a statue that's in conflict with itself. And I tried to use that as a metaphor for understanding the way in which Americans wrestled over the meaning of the Great War during the 1920s and 30s, that uh, really no, no single coherent uh, body of myth emerges to help Americans understand this war. Instead, we get competing representations. But having reflected on this statue a bit more, I've really changed my interpretation of it. What strikes me about it now is the way that it fuses these elements of realism and triumphalism, okay? In a way that was obviously quite appealing to American communities. So I think when we look at the statue, what, what we're seeing is evidence that Americans did not sour on the idea of the Great War as a heroic, ennobling episode in the nation's history, simply because of the League of Nations debacle. They didn't even sour on the idea of military service carrying benefits, uh, turning soldiers into men, if you will, models of American masculinity and strength and vigor. Uh, they did not move away from that idea, even as the United States moved into an isolationist phase. Jennifer Wingate, an art historian, has interpreted this statue within the context of the influenza epidemic. This is an image of vital, strong American manhood in the midst of a period of uh, devastating disease. It's also an image you can put in the context of the Red Scare that followed the Great War. American soldiers returning home okay, with strength, with purpose, committed to the ideals of the Republic, and intolerant of, uh, of any sort of uh, subversive activities on the part of those who have a different political philosophy. So I think when we look at this statue, it really goes back to the point that my colleague Sebastian was making at this presentation earlier today, uh, that we tend to take the literary archetypes created by a very, very narrow segment of the population as our way of understanding the way that people, quote unquote, remembered the war. And I think when we start looking at other artifacts like this one, we get a very different picture. So thank you all very much.